you can go to my website, richardterrell.com, and learn more. Um, a lot of the poems in this book, and this is where actually where I got the idea for this service, borrow a line from another source and then use that line as the title of my poem. So a lot of this is, is borrowed. Um, this poem takes both as its title and its last line, something from, from Walt Whitman. Uh, you may even uh, recognize at least the title line. And Whitman, you know, was a great spiritual teacher. Um, and uh, he was also a favorite of the transcendentalists back in the 19th century, who of course were mostly UUs. Uh, so here's the poem beginning with Whitman's line. I think I could turn and live with animals, Walt Whitman. Life is good, I tell my little dog, and give him his pill for pain and his pill for the swelling in his spine and the one to relax the muscles, which are tense, I suppose, from not knowing when the pain will come again. I give him the pill for the blood in his stool that one of the other pills causes, we don't know which. So he will feel fine the next morning. And remember, I'm not sure what or how much, but will want to go for the longer walk that he would later regret if I let him walk longer. And if he were able to regret any joy and the moment and the fine air and the messages it carries. Life is good, I tell my little dog, and I believe in the moment he hears and obeys. So placid and self-contained, I look at him long and long. So we learn from animals as well. Uh, okay, Larry is up next. Okay, well, the first tune we're going to present is uh, my arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, like a lot of you, probably, we bristle at its kind of drum-beating, kind of patriotic, um, blind patriot kind of presentation of the piece. I still, It still has meaning to me, but I decided I wanted to slow it down, turn it into a ballad, and, and look at it maybe the way Gershwin might have looked at it if he wrote it. So I use things that musicians would call like descending bass lines and 2-5-1 progressions and things like that. I also liked mixing in some other musical moments into it. So I start with an introduction, a very brief introduction from the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and then a very short kind of ending from America the Beautiful. So now I'm going to share my screen. And I'm just going to make sure that I have the right thing up in a moment. And I just want to also make sure that my computer is still sharing audio, so I have to move my mouse around a little bit to make sure that's happening. Actually, I'm having a little trouble with that, so just bear with me. Okay, it's, there we go. Now the screen's coming down, and it looks like it's sharing audio. So we'll give this a shot. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, the next poem I'd like to read uh, borrows from, it's, it's tone from the poet W.S. Merwin, who died just a year or two ago. And Merwin's writing uh, often was environmentally aware, um, often about his, his uh, adopted home in Hawaii. I'm also borrowing the form in this poem, the form of a letter. 
I think that a letter sometimes allows us to be more direct and honest than we usually are when we're just talking to someone, maybe especially in Minnesota, uh, and certainly in a way that email works against that directness or honesty. This may be especially true if it's a letter to someone we've never met. Um, this poem is in the form of a letter to the future about our current environmental crisis. Dear future, what you think of us will not be your first concern, just as you were not ours. You won't know we thought our diligence would be your salvation, that we looked out at the trees and they just stood there. We each cast a single shadow, longer at twilight, yes, but soon we couldn't recognize darkness. Each pin in the map stood for 10,000 and there were tens of thousands of pins. So we made more maps, but found the world wouldn't grow. Future, we knew so much for sure, there wasn't room for it all. Each mind was like a garage, so stuffed with belongings that cars had to park on the streets. Soon there was simply not enough dignity to go around or fresh water which became the same thing. The very air was like bird song. We thought we could identify, but the birds knew it not at all, so didn't sing. They couldn't fly any further south than this. We thought we could change the subject, that there were kingdoms yet to come. We held truth to be self-evident, but it proved to be disguised, difficult, to tease out from our habits and necessities, which became an embarrassment of exceptions. The moon itself could be populated, couldn't it? The stars bore out our cold abstractions. Down the pipe, always another pagan invention, each meadow a place on which nothing was built yet. People grew sadder for what seemed like a long time and then they got mad. Future, perhaps you know. They had come to believe in pure mind until matter put an end to that short semester. They never thought that if the wolves roamed too close to the door, their houses had been built too close to the forest. Future, you became our article of faith, a proper name legally changed to rhyme with ours. If tomorrow as I write is the beginning of you, the atoms of the days and years between us may change slowly enough like failing light that you will even think you remember gardens. The next piece we're gonna do is We Shall Overcome. I could spend a whole hour talking about the origins of that but I'm not going to do that. The short story is that uh, it's um, based principally on I'll Overcome Someday, which was published in 1901 by Charles Albert Tindley, and it was a very popular spiritual in the black churches in the 1800s. And the composers of We Shall Overcome largely based their lyrics on that. The melody actually comes uh, from the church, uh, from the Catholic church, the first part is from O Sanctissima, a Roman Catholic hymn. And then also uh, the second half comes from uh, the hymn, I'll Be All Right. What I did is I put some jazz harmonies on it and, um, and then recorded it a few years back on a CD called Tuscarora. So I will share my screen and get it up here.
So I'll remind you that our theme today, our subject is uh, what we borrow, what we get from other sources in our spiritual lives and with Larry and me uh, in our creative lives. Um, in this poem, I borrow from myself. Um, I borrow some early lines from early poems. The poem is called Early Poems. And I, I take lines that I wrote as a young man in my 20s and 30s uh, and uh, and re-examine them. So I guess it's a poem about gaining of wisdom with age, which is something we all hope for, whether it happens or not, maybe we'll never know, or at least getting a perspective on our personal past. And so the poems that I borrow, I'll use the little rabbit here, uh, the lines that I borrow from myself. Early poems. The images are like old friends I no longer have enough in common with. Three sweatered like a crusted pine. The fisherman scent of imagined waves. He shakes his cock like a tired flag. I pretend I wouldn't recognize them on a dark street, even with a gang of marching nationalist editors gaining on me from behind, red pencils sharpened to pin accuracy. And it was always night in these young poems. Night is evening's secret, a myth about a night world. We wait for night and night feeding bass as if daylight were owned by prose and of little interest, mostly because there was no bourbon in it. And what did the young man know about love? Too simple for listeners, too difficult for art, that now he wouldn't cut back until the part about how hard it is 
was left to extend its bare branch into the winter sky. The next piece we're going to do is one that's really um, personal to me. Uh, it's named after my Aunt Mary Lou. It's called Tango para Maria Luisa. Um, and she was the other professional pianist in the family, and we had bonded really well. We have a very small family. I have five cousins total and just one aunt and one uncle who have passed. And she knew her time was near and asked if I would play at her funeral. And I was going to play something classical, but I was on my way home through northern, I uh, northern Iowa, and um, I, I was listening to a jazz CD that I had gotten recently from the saxophone and flutist, Doug Little. And a tango was on, and he was playing on the bass clarinet. It was really cool. And and uh, I turned it off and kind of got into my thoughts, and this alternative tango started to appear in my psyche. And uh, I liked it. I was very worried I would forget it. Uh, even back then, I was old enough to forget most of the important stuff. And so I pulled over, uh, maybe around Charles City or something, and wrote it out. Um, it was odd because it was in 9-4 other than 4-4, four, four, which is kind of unusual. And I got home and, and played it, and there it was. And it's the only time I've ever written anything not at the piano that stuck. So now I'm going to share the screen here. Thank you. 
Richard and I recorded that with uh, our quartet um, on the CD Alice and Stonehenge. I wanted to uh, include a, at least one lighter poem. Um, and this one, uh, since uh, the Twins uh, and all of baseball was playing this year before empty stadiums, uh, this one's this one was oddly prescient. I wrote it, I think, a couple of years ago or more before COVID. Um, and um, as I mentioned, a lot of the poems borrow as their title a line from another source. And the title of this one comes from the baseball pitcher Dizzy Dean, um, who was a, a pitch in the 1930s for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, if you're a baseball fan, you know about Dizzy Dean. He was a, a country boy, I think from Arkansas or Missouri. And if you're around my age, you remember that in the late 50s and early 60s, Dizzy Dean and Pee Wee Reese were the announcers for the, the game of the week on CBS, uh, broadcasting baseball. And Dizzy Dean was famous for, uh, or infamous, for butchering the English language. And he uh, said once at the end of a broadcast, fans, don't fail to miss tomorrow's game. And that's the title of the poem. If there's, any, if there's anything spiritual in this poem, it's at, it's at the end. You know, so you can listen for that if you like. Fans don't fail to miss tomorrow's game, Dizzy Dean. Otherwise, you may be in the stands alone since this broadcast reaches a wide audience. If tomorrow comes as scheduled, no athletes will leave their caps on during an anthem that won't be played, the flag that won't be flying may lack both stars and stripes. It will be the opposite of extra innings, less than rain shortened. No zeros will be affixed to the center field scoreboard above the green ivy that will still grow in lovely entanglement with the afternoon sun. No promotions, no giveaways, but the overpriced hot dogs will be as good as free if you can find a vendor. The beer would flow past the seventh inning curfew if your thirst for it hadn't stayed away. Like everyone else who listened to this broadcast, which reached a wide audience, Baseball, so much like life, bench warming at the end of the dugout, stealing signs, left stranded in scoring position, sacrifice, option to triple A, long periods of inaction broken by drama that's usually unproductive. Baseball, so much like life that for tomorrow's game, you even know the final score. I've always liked the uh, musician Chick Corea, and there was a tune in particular of his that I liked a lot called Sea Journey. And I always liked the rhythmic pattern that begins that piece. And it, it sat in my head for a long time. I'm going to try to get myself over to it now play just a little bit of it. So that sat in my head for a long time, and it showed up in a piece that I was conceiving a few years back called Scirocco. So Scirocco are winds uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, North Africa, and they blow at hurricane force for long periods of time, and then they die out into nothing, and then may reoccur the next day. So I conceived of a piece that would have a very kind of intense Middle Eastern feel and then a very quiet section. And at the time I was working on it, this rhythmic pattern from this piece was still floating somewhere in my subconscious. And so I came up with kind of an alternative pattern 
because uh, that piece is in 7-4, I, I wrote this my piece in 7-4 with each bar dividing evenly into two patterns of 7-8 loosely based on that pattern. And it has an intense section and then a quiet section in the middle. It's called Scirocco. And I have to get myself over to it here. Here we go. Richard and I recorded that on uh, a CD of the two of ours um, called Solitude, Poetry, and Jazz.
Well, I get the last words and I wanna thank you for inviting us again. And I hope that uh, if we see you next year, it can be face to face like the good old days. Um, a, a lot of you perhaps have cabins in the woods living where we do, or, or like me, you had one uh, as a child, as a kid growing up. This is another poem about youth and age and I've borrowed it. Uh, the source of it is, is W.B. Yeats. Uh, his poem, The Lake Isle of Inish Free. Uh, you have to be kind of a fool to, you know, try to model a poem on the greatest poet of the last century, but, you know, I qualify, I did it. Uh, Yeats' poem starts off something like this. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and I'll live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. And he goes on from there. So, so I've Wisconsinized it. Um, and my poem is called The Lake After Yates. I'm getting up soon and going to the lake where my father's cabin leans towards the north more chinks between the logs than last year's newsprint could patch. Old kitchen pots on the front room floor to catch the roof's leaks. I'll catch black bass after dark in the lily pads. And each day my father will talk about hunting birds this fall and my mother will read a book and occasionally remember dreaming. It's a place of such anticipation as when morning lifts its dew over the grass in August and over blueberries too small in the wetlands never grown sweet and the bittern standing on one leg and the loon sane as day. The mosquito buzz at evening sends us indoors mostly safely Everyone knows that joke and the holes in the rusted screens. Okay, I'm getting up now because for days I've heard the frogs awakening and the blackbirds find syllables and the few cars on the road hidden behind the young red pines. I'm down that road away, always away now and looking toward its farthest bend. Thank you. We'll see you down the road. Thank you so much. That was very good. I enjoyed that. Now, how do I unspotlight spotlight you here now? Uh, <laughs> I like the spotlight. I'll mute myself. I can spotlight myself. Here we go. There we go. All right. Um, so that was awesome. We are nearing 1130. Um, but are there any closing reflections that anybody is burning to share or uh, um, um, anything like that? Let's stop.